This lecture, Lecture 5 on Agronomy Management, is part of the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology. It has two code names, ALM110 and AGR1 AGR. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. This subject is taught also by Tony Kent. For more information on this topic, and other products that we offer, please visit our website at www.nmit.edu.au. In this lecture today, specifically, we will be looking at plant growth measurement, and this will be followed by looking at yield, defining both economic biological yield and considering the inputs and assessment of yield. To put this lecture in context, it is part of the basic crop physiology topic that you will be covering in this subject. Growth is a change in size. Plants grow all the time, but under different management practices, under different climates, they grow at different rates. In the next few slides, we are going to learn about the calculation of a change in size. This change in size can be a area or it can be a weight. We will start by looking at a change in area, then we will move on to looking at a change of weight. On the image in the slide you have two leaves, leaf A and leaf B. Leaf A was measured initially at 5 cm squared. This is the smaller inner leaf. This measurement was taken on the 1st of January 2013. On the 10th of January, in ideal conditions, this leaf was measured again. This time the area was calculated to be 10 cm squared. This has resulted in a doubling in the increase in size. A second leaf was measured, leaf B. On the 1st of January, the area of this leaf was determined at 50 cm squared. Ten days later, on the 10th of January 2013, this leaf was 55 cm squared. We can say that leaf B has had a 9% increase in leaf growth. You will observe that both of these leaves increase their area by 5 cm squared. However, there was a significant difference in the percentage change between these leaves. Leaf B increased in percentage by 9%, while leaf A increased by 50%. This measurement or calculation of increase is described as the absolute growth rate. In this slide, we will examine a change in growth by looking at plant weight. Here we have two leaves. The first leaf weighed one gram on the 1st of January. Ten days later it was measured again on the 10th of January and it weighed two grams. In our illustration, the first leaf weight is described as A and the second leaf weight is described as A1. A second leaf was measured in the 1st of January, leaf B was measured at 50 grams and then on the 10th of January re-weighed and it, and it weighed 55 grams. As you can see again, there has been a bigger increase in the weight of A than in the weight of B. This is a measurement of absolute growth rate. Another way of measuring a change in size is to calculate the relative growth rate. Here we will look at an example of calculating the relative growth rate of a leaf. We will start by calculating the relative growth rate of leaf B. Firstly, we start by identifying the formulae. I would always start by writing out the formula and understanding what each of the relative components are. Capital RGR stands for relative growth rate. This equals a log change in weight of the, the second measurement minus a log change in weight of the first measurement 
divided by the change in time. Always make sure that you change that you place your time in the same units. So for the for this example, T2 will be 10 and T1 will be 0. Therefore the change in time will be 10 days. With the change in weight, it is important that you start your, your calculations with putting the weights in as the same, and ideally you would use SI units. In this case, weight should be determined in grams. So now that we have identified the formula, the second stage is to identify the measurements. For this, we will need to identify T1, T2, W1 and W2. T represents time and in our equation is given as days, therefore we have to convert our dates into days. Time 1, the 1st of January 2013, time 2, the 10th of January 2013. Our weights are given in grams, so no conversion in this case is necessary. Select the correct weight for the correct time point, so W1 is 50 grams while W2 is 55 grams. Check your units and convert if necessary. This is stage 3. In our example this is not necessary, but there are some situations where you would have to be mindful of this. Once you have checked your units and they are in acceptable units and are both consistent, you can then move off to the next stage. The fourth uh, stage is to place your data into the formula. Here we can see relative growth rate equals a change of log of 50 minus a log 55 divided by the change in time, 10 days minus 1 day. The final stage is to start calculating, or do the mathematical component of the equation. I would always recommend starting with a new formula by going through stage by stage and slowly reducing so that you do not make mistakes. Also, if you do make mistakes, sometimes marks will still be given for your methodology rather than your ability to calculate. Here we can see how we have come to the relative growth rate of 0.01. Take some time to stop the lecture now and ensure that you understand each of these stages. In order to attest your ability to calculate relative growth rate, you can repeat the above calculation for plant A. Please use the template below for the first time you do this calculation. Which plant, height, which plant was the highest relative growth rate? Plant A or plant B? and can you explain your findings? For plant growth analysis and for relative growth rate, I have designed an Excel sheet to calculate relative growth rate. Once you have placed your data, the time and the dry weight in the columns, you can compare your answers with the spreadsheet. Are they the same? If not, you should be aware of this and trying to find out why, as they should be the same. If you are very interested in the topic of relative growth rate or wish to expand your knowledge, the following literature is recommended. It will not be essential for you to read this literature to pass this subject, but it is essential that you understand how you calculate absolute growth rates and relative growth rates. If this has been a problem, then I do highly recommend the books by Hunt et al. 2002, A Modern Tool for Classical Plant Growth Analysis. This article and other articles that Rod Hunt has written do explain the methodology behind plant growth analysis very well. So, let us now look at yield. What is yield? Yield can be characterised by either economic or biological yield. Economic yield is the components of plants that result in the value, while the biological yield is an increase in the total above ground parts. The measurement can include economic yield. The biological yield can also be shown in total biomass. The distinction between these components, biological or economic yield, is very important in making decisions in agronomy. 
So let us look at some fundamentals of yields. How do plants produce, yield or grow? One of the most important imp inputs to this is the process of photosynthesis. In photosynthesis there are two reactions. The light reaction which enables the harvesting of light energy. That light energy comes from the sun. The sunlight is captured and converted into chemical energy. The chemical energy is in two forms, ATP and NADPH. The second reaction of photosynthesis is um, called the carbon reactions. This is where chemical energy from the light reactions can be converted into a compound that can be used and transported throughout the plant. One of the compounds that is commonly used is the conversion of glucose to sucrose and it is sucrose that is transported around the plant. Both sucrose and glucose can be used to produce yield production or they can be stored in the roots or other storage organs. The inputs that enable photosynthesis are light, carbon dioxide and water. Now let us look at yield potential. The yield of an adapted crop variety or hybrid when grown under favourable conditions without growth limitation from either water, nutrients, pests or diseases is defined by Lobel in 2009 as yield potential. Often in agronomy we do not obtain our yield potential. Sometimes we do not obtain it because of the climate and other times as farmers we make decisions not to obtain it because the inputs would be economically unviable. Now we're going to look at a case study and yield put together by Kansas State University. It's corn versus grain for sorghum. Rate of corn yield increase was greatest in rain fed, high water holding capacity soils intermediate for irrigation environments and lowest in rain fed low water holding soils. The rate of grain sorghum yield increase was low and similar to the lowest corn yield increase rate for the rain fed low water holding capacity soils. Corn acreage will likely increase unless grain sorghum yields increase. This shows us that the climate and the soils interacting together result in our final rate of yield production and that they are indeed different for different species. Potential yield is not reaching when an input is limiting. This is described by the limitation of growth factors. There have been two laws that have been developed to allow us to understand these concepts. The first, law, the first law is Lieberg's law of the minimum and the second is Mitchell's law of diminishing returns. Labor's law of the minimum states a deficiency or absence of one necessary constituent, all others being present, renders the soil barren for crops which need that nutrient. You can see a visual representation from the Kansas State University summarising this concept. The concept of the most limiting factor is slightly different. Just as the capacity of a wooden bucket to hold water is determined by the height of the shortest stay, crop yields are restricted by the nutrients in the shortest supply. Again, this visual representation of all the nutrient inputs and the yield being represented here by the water demonstrates this concept. This was produced by Kansas State University. In the law of diminishing returns, the increase in any crop produced by a unit increment or a deficient factor is proportional to the decrement of that factor from the maximum. The graph on the slide summarises this relationship. On the left hand side you have yield percent of maximum. On the x axis you have increments of input. The line in the middle from zero through to 100 shows the relationship. If you look at this, the yield at 
you have x increments. If you look at 100% of maximum yield, you have 3 times y increments. And the difference between the increments between 100 and 50% yield gives you an example of the diminishing returns. Density of seedlings can affect the yield components and the crop growth. In this diagram you will see a table showing seed density in kilograms per hectare with factors such as, as compared to the plants per meter squared or density. You can then see the relationship between certain physiological aspects, so things for spikes per plant or grains per spikelet. These are all components that make up yield. Please take some time to look at each of these components and how seed density may impact them. Ask yourself, as seed density increases, does the physiological component increase? Does the grains per speckle increase or not? The phylochon is defined as the interval between similar growth stages of two successive leaves in the same column. It has been re used extensively to understand and describe its serial development. The phylochrone is strongly dependent on temperature, as stated by Richmond and Kelpie in 1991, Kepper, sorry, but severe water deaths by Cupforth et al. in 1992, and strong nutrient deficiency by Longnecker et al. in 1993. Retard, retarded the leaf emergence rate in spring wheat. This was demonstrated by Frank and Bura in 1995, who observed genetic variation differences in the phylochrone of genotypes of bread wheat and durum wheat. So let us think about how well a crop can adapt to a climate or soil type and how this affects on the yield. Adaptability is a good performance over wide geographic regions under variable climate and environmental conditions. Adaptability is a measure of crop reliability. Ideally a cultivar would yield well under both good and adverse conditions. Stability is the ability of a cultivar to yield consistently over a wide range of environmental conditions. This uh, figure on the slide shows the relationship between high yield and wide adaptability. The yield is on the y-axis and the environmental conditions are on the, the x-axis, with the optimal condition being placed in the centre. You can see the difference between the hybrid corn, which is a corn that's been bred specifically for good adaptability, and an open corn variety which has been bred in more traditional terms. The closer that you ob obtain optimal should be result in a better yield. However, the flatter this graph, the better your adaptability is. That is that you are able to sustain a good yield over a number of environmental conditions. There are many reasons why good adaptability is ideal for farmers particularly as you're considering your economic inputs. In agronomy, we have to think not only about the yield as a quantity, but also as the yield as a quality, as often we are paid on quality. This will be things like feed grains or food grains, <coughs> forages or horticultural crops particularly are paid on quality. What is quality? In fact, it's a term that in industries like viticulture have come away from in recent years. They prefer to use chemical composition or consumer preference. It can be hard to define. It may be a colour, a texture, a protein level or a quantity of protein, gluten strength, digestibility or nitrogen content or it may be a combination of many of these features. The following table demonstrates the relationship between alpha alfalfa yield and quality. We're looking specifically at the effect of maturity stage on the first cutting alfalfa yields and quality. This means the alfalfa was grown and it was then cut back. 
and after the first cutback there are um, physiological aspects of this crop that were measured such as yield and crop height. These measurements were taken at many stages throughout the plant's growth. Vegetative, early bud, late bud, first regrowth, 25% bloom, this is the stage of flowering, 50% bloom, full bloom, and green seed pod. As you can see from this data, that as the crop matures, the crop height increases. So do does the yield measured in mega megagrams per hectare. The dry matter accumulation also increases and so do other components such as the protein and the colour. This brings us to the end of lecture 5. I hope after watching this lecture you understand about the differences between actual and potential yield. That you understand that there is plasticity in yield, that is the season, the climate, the cultivar and the manageable inputs can all affect this. Inputs that may limit yield and associated theory. And finally, that you, have un you understand that there is a relationship between yield and quality. And sometimes this relationship is critical with respect to payment and how, how this is achieved. This brings us to the end of this lecture.